All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining our webinar today. I am Joe Sapp with Tally Management Group. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about strategic planning, uh, specifically the evolution of your strategic plan and to talk about what we see going on with strategic planning for associations now with recent impacts from COVID-19 and just some best practices that you should be aware of. Joining me today are two colleagues, uh, Greg Talley and Nikanor Sabula. Uh, first, I'll, I'll start with an introduction myself. I'm, as I said, I'm Joe. I've been with PMG for about 13 years now, served in a variety of roles, including executive director for several of our organizations. I facilitate strategic planning for organizations and worked in just about every program you could think of for an association. And with me also, as I mentioned, is Greg. Greg? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Greg Talley, President and CEO of Talley Management Group. Delighted to spend some time with you this afternoon and talk about uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, which is strategic planning for nonprofit organizations. And we've been consulting with our own clients and then numerous external clients for years on helping them really clarify vision and mission and how they build a plan that helps them achieve that. Good to be with you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good uh, uh, afternoon uh, from wherever you, 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 you're joining us from. My name is uh, Nikanor Sabula, uh, speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm the managing director of AFAMCO, uh, which is an African association management company affiliated to uh, the Tally Group. And uh, glad to be here to share with you uh, our African experience, how we are supporting associations uh, here on the continent and uh, what we can do together to be able to uh, provide you with support um, uh, throughout this uh, period of the pandemic and, and beyond. So uh, great to speak to you and I look forward to engaging further. Yeah, so to lead things off, I'll share a quick quote here that we've used with several of our webinars. We can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And, you know, we've used this quote before, but it's even more relevant now when we talk about strategic planning, uh, how we've done strategic planning and how we need to do it going forward, not just in consideration of the pandemic, but uh, as organizations, things become faster. We need to react uh, faster to the, the ongoing environment and the competition that's in front of us. So, as we talk about strategic planning, Greg? Yeah, so you know, I think it's, it it's, I've certainly watched it evolve over my career now, 33 years. I'm old enough to remember when we used to have discussions about 10-year plans. Um, and then uh, not that long ago, we realized that wasn't going to work and started talking more about five-year plans. And as sh short as probably three, four years ago, we had adjusted it down even further to looking at a three to five-year time frame. And I would say within the last two years, it's been pretty clear that it's two-year chunks that we really should be focusing on because uh, anything longer and it's just all changing too much and anything shorter doesn't really do much for us to, to figure out a multi-year plan and multi-year effort of resources um, and application. Um, but it's been interesting in this period because I've heard everything from, you know, you should take your current plan and throw it out um, to know if, you're, if your goals are right and your vision's right, you're fine. And I'm not sure that's an either or. Um, I think it's a combination of both, that um, we really need to pay more attention to it now in light of what's happening to our industry and more importantly, our members and stakeholders. Um, and, and now take what's happening and look at our current plan to say how should and could this need to be adjusted to reflect what our stakeholders and members are experiencing today. And the fact of the matter is, everything's changing so quickly. So the pace of our thinking, the pace of our planning has got to step up. I constantly hear people say, what are you doing with all your extra time to slow down? I don't know about you, but in most of the associations that we work with, it's been anything but a slowdown. It has been crisis planning, and that's what we have to talk about. Thanks, Greg. And you know, one of the key points around uh, how quick things move with associations these days, uh, it's data and being data-driven is important. Uh, you know, as we lead off and talk about some of the different aspects of strategic planning, uh, we wanted to highlight this specifically about being data-driven. And uh, if you don't understand it, you need to have a partner that does, that can collect the key data points and be able to communicate it to you 
as the decision makers of your organization. You know, as you, you sit here and look at the decisions you made around your annual meeting and whether you're gonna have that meeting um, in the face of the pandemic or if it's gonna be a virtual meeting, how much data were you consuming as an organization? Were you looking at the, the federal government's guidelines and um, infection rates and the state guidelines and local guidelines? There's a lot of data that needs to be consumed to make those decisions. Uh, and just the same that you were doing that with uh, whether you're gonna hold your meeting or not, you need to apply that elsewhere in your strategic planning where you're talking about stakeholder value and engagement. Data needs to be able to be a part of that so you can make informed decisions. Well, and this is where member attitudes and member perceptions become so important. So this idea of how often are you pinging into your members and stakeholders probably needs to increase even more now because it's their attitudes on so many of these issues, what's happening to them in their daily lives that become critical to planning through this. So in fact, we need more communication and data from our members and stakeholders than we ever did. So it really becomes kind of, I'm seeing a lot of groups are doing pulse surveys of their members because it is changing so quickly, both in terms of real at things that are impacting them, as well as their perceptions and their thinking about what they need from you as an association. And therefore, how do we need to, to change and be more nimble to address what they need now that might be very different from what our plan of work was going to be under the old plan. Yeah, and, and a point to that idea, Greg, is uh, the data is changing quickly. You know, as you get uh, into the, as we got into the pandemic, whole industries were changing by the week. Uh, and while you may have data from four months ago about how your members are feeling, how their uh, jobs were uh, stable and secure, that's all changed. And to make sure that you are uh, using relevant data sources for that decision making. You know, as we jump into some of the traditional strategic planning efforts, um, you know, we'll run through these and, and you know, we share these to give you an idea of the different options that are there in terms of how you conduct the strategic plan and how you can implement several of these, not just in a one-time fashion, but, but something we're going to talk a little bit more about in an ongoing effort to continually hone your strategic plan. The first one there, the balanced scorecard, uh, I think you've, you've probably all seen this. It's one of the most widely used uh, forms of strategic planning and monitoring a strategic plan where you're measuring objectives, um, different initiatives, and uh, it's probably color-coded to give you an idea of uh, who's responsible for what, what the status is of those initiatives and, uh, and goals. Then you have a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and, and that's a, a really valuable process to go through because it is giving you a chance to take a wider look at the different things impacting your organization. And to go along with that SWOT analysis, a test analysis, and this probably isn't as used as often, but combining a SWOT with a test analysis, which stands for uh, political, economic, social, culture, and technological, um, that's gonna help you analyze the external factors that are out there impacting your organization uh, and your industry specifically. Uh, to take a wider look at what's going on in your uh, your sphere. And then gap planning. This often is called a gap analysis as well, which is really uh, analyzing, um, uh, it could be member needs, it could be analyzing the different programs you have, how they're impacting your members, uh, where they're not providing the, the service and, and level of uh, uh, support that you may need uh, to your members. And then blue ocean planning. Uh, which is really taking a wider look at, at how we can make an impact uh, if we have all the resources uh, to do that. So, you know, these are, these are traditional models that are put in place. I, I do want to emphasize that they don't have to be used uh, one time. This uh, should be an ongoing process where you're, you're utilizing these features throughout the year, through the evolution of your strategic plan and checking back to these. They should be living and the results of these um, efforts should be living and breathing uh, documents uh, and plans that you can pull out, you can look at, you can address uh, and make adjustments in real time. Well, the other point, Joe, I think is actually a combination of all of these um, is really gives you some of the robustness that you're going to need, particularly now. 
Um, and what I, what I keep coming back to is so much has changed and that creates challenges and opportunities. So this issue about the gap analysis, what do our members want versus what are we providing in this point in time right now becomes really important to understand. So that's one way of looking at a, a gap analysis. The pest analysis, there is so much happening in our lives just as parents, just as employees um, that you, you need to understand those pressures that are impacting your members as well because that comes into play in how they're interacting with you and what they may need and want from you. So it really is a, a combination of all of these tools becomes really important to start to understand what's happening and start to begin to build plans forward that uh, directly apply to what your members and your stakeholders need and want um, to help them get through this. Yep. And you know, when you look at all these combined, uh, it's a mix of it, uh, internal review and also external impacts uh, for the organization. Just quickly, probably, uh, uh, if I could add in, um, interesting that um, um, there is a new emerging thinking just un under the, the pest, you know, uh, ordinarily the E has, has stood for the environmental, you know, the, the environment you're operating in, um, but there's a new thinking that talks about emergency. I think you need now to be able to uh, analyze, uh, uh, I think, what the pandemic has shown us. How ready are you in terms of the emergencies that could, um, could, could come and, and, and hit uh, the particular industry that um, your association actually um, operates in? So I think um, that is a new thinking that is beginning to emerge in terms of something that you have to keep uh, a very close eye on. Great point. Great point. Uh, Deacon, or you want to talk a little about the organic model? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I think in, in terms of uh, looking at um, uh, from an, an organic model point of view, um, it is important uh, to begin to clarify, you know, the, the vision and, and the values um, uh, you have as, as, as an organization, as, as an association. Um, and we've got the, the bigger picture of, of, of what you want to become uh, as, as an, an association and the values that you, you want to espouse. Um, and therefore, it is important that there is a clarity. Uh, you know, your vision is very clear, not only just to yourself, but also to your stakeholders. And beyond just having well-written values, and I see lots of organizations that will say these are our values, you must be able to live those values. Your stakeholders must be able to feel and uh, be assured that indeed, uh, if you talk about um, uh, being an ethical organization, you live that. If you're talking about being a socially responsible organization, they can actually see um, that, um, that you're actually living through those values. Um, and then the other thing you need to look at is in terms of uh, uh, creating a, a personal action plan uh, for the stakeholders. I think uh, Joe did speak about um, uh, being data driven. And one of the things uh, you must then be able to do is um, conduct and carry out a, a stakeholders analysis. You must be able to understand, uh, you know, um, your stakeholders, you know, who do you keep satisfied? And if you know the, the model that, uh, that, that exists in terms of stakeholders analysis, who are your stakeholders that you need to satisfy? You know, you have to keep them satisfied. And from an association standpoint, you're looking at your members because this is your core uh, stakeholders. You must be able to regularly communicate to them. You must be able to inform them. And then there are those stakeholders that you look at and you want to manage them very, very closely. And so this will be your donors, this will be your funders, uh, you know, uh, the benefactors of, of your of your, of your your And then there are those ones that you have to monitor very closely because the decisions they make actually will have an impact on your, on your association. And this, these are government, these are, these are, these are uh, policy makers and such. And then you also want to have those that you keep informed. Um, and these are your uh, uh, industry colleagues, people that you work uh, um, work with closely. And so once you have identified uh, these stakeholders, then you want to be able to create personal action plans in terms of how you want to deal uh, with each of these uh, stakeholders. And then finally, of course, your, your stakeholders report, uh, um, um, you must then be able to to, to, to report the, the results of the action plans that, um, that you've, uh, you've, you've been able to develop, um, keeping your stakeholders in for, involved, assuring them that um, any emerging issues are being dealt with as per your plan. But also you're using that uh, report 
um, to be able to uh, inform the decision you make at a board level, but also at a management level. So I think that's, that's how that pans out. Yeah, you know, and, one of the things that, that we've seen is doing work here in the United States and internationally and, and most recently in Africa is that the issues are really very much the same um, between associations um, all over the globe. And it all starts really right here on this slide with the clarity of the vision and mission um, of the organization. And it's shocking um, whether I'm dealing and consulting with associations here in the United States or overseas, how little their clarity there actually is within organizations. To sit down and ask the board, what is our vision statement? Um, can they articulate that clearly? Um, and in so many cases, they can't. Um, and figure if your board can't articulate that clearly and get the why we exist and what we're here to do for whom and can say that clearly and concisely to everybody they're speaking to, we've got a problem. Um, so it really does come back to that. Um, and I, I see that literally around the globe. So we have to kind of keep coming back to the basics of why do we exist and what are we here to do? Great points. So this just is driven home, right, by what we're all living through and experiencing right now. And, and Joe referenced it before. But one of the things that several of the points that we're talking about really are reflected in the seven measures of success, which is a, a study that ASAE did, the American Society of Association Executives, that really looked at what makes those organizations successful over long term. And one of them is this ability to be nimble. Um, the ability to look around, understand what's happening, be ready and able to change, and then actually do it, right? In associations, we're really good at talking. Um, we're really good at talking about things, but actually doing it becomes something different. And our challenge when we do it is we add it on to what we're already doing, as opposed to saying we need to stop doing some things and we need to do these new things and put resources and energy to, to these new things. So it really becomes important on us as the board and executive directors to lead our boards and lead our organizations through these changes. Um, folks are scared. Um, as we pointed out, and as you well know, there are industries that are going to be permanently changed out of this. There are associations that are not going to survive this. Um, if there were associations that didn't have appropriate insurance in place and relied 30 to 50% of their operating budget on their uh, annual meeting, and they had to cancel that annual meeting, wow, um, their very survival is at risk. How quickly was your organization able to pivot? How are you able to pivot to a virtual environment, um, to being able to deliver all of your critical um, products and services to your members on a mobile device? Um, now than ever before, that's the kind of change and it's picking up speed um, in terms of how this is going. So boards have to deal with this. I maintain at every single board meeting needs to be talking about what else is changing in our members and stakeholders lives and how do we need to respond to that? And do we have the wherewithal to do it? Um, if this isn't the time for why a reserve fund existed, I don't know when else you would use it, but many organizations have potentially blown through their reserve fund simply to cover the loss of one year's annual revenue from their, um, their annual event. So these are challenging times for organizations. So it's more important than ever to kind of step away go into a room, go into a Zoom room, um, and really just focus and talk about what does this mean for us? And what do we have to be doing differently? What do we have to think differently about? And it's changing so quickly and our mindset is very much not changing with the speed of what's changing around us. And I think that's the risk for associations. And I'm living it, I'm a volunteer on some international organizations and we're using the same language now for stuff that is very different. Um, and we're catching ourselves in that, right? Both the speed of change, but also how we're talking about, how we're articulating about what's happening in our space and what the future of our space needs to look like and how we need to talk about that is a different set of language. So it's, uh, it's fascinating times, but I think there's more opportunity um, than challenge. And I think that's the, the really interesting part of this is if you can think strategically, and have good data, I think there's opportunity for you to find for your organizations and different ways of doing things and different ways of delivering things. And that's the excitement and uh, that I'm excited about for lots of organizations. 
Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Nikanor. No, I mean, um, I just wanted to to share. You know, a lot of a lot of, a lot of uh, um, uh, um, inquiries that I receive and the conversation I'm having with the with the associations is is around the whole um, idea around resilience and how do you make your, um, your your association resilient? And resilient is very closely linked to the speed uh, within which you're then you're, you're changing. And I think people are coming to me and and, and, and asking how do we make quick decision and ensure that during this pandemic, we are not also making mistakes. So we're not making quick decisions that are going to um, uh, uh, drive us you know, into, into waters that we don't expect. So one of the key things, and I think we've spoken to this, is all around how do you make decisions based on the data you're collecting. So which means that it is, it's important that continually you're collecting data, sitting down, analyzing that data, and ensuring that that data is informing the kind of changes um, that, that you want to have. So um, I thought I would just uh, emphasize that. Um, um, so on, on, really great yeah. point, Nikanor, this whole issue about kind of mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes in this period. The issue is how quickly do we recognize it's a mistake and then change to something else, right? So you're exactly right. But this idea that we've got to go with the best information we have at the time, and that may change a month from now. But we can as associations kind of sit back and wait for there to be the right time to make a decision because our members are counting on us to lead our members are counting on us to help them mm -hmm. and it's okay to say hey based on the data of last month we made this decision we moved in this direction the new data is telling us something different we're doing something different which really speaks to the issue around communication that has to go into this process with your stakeholders with your members I think everyone recognizes these are challenging times, these are difficult times. So if you can kind of increase your level of transparency and increase your level of communication, you're gonna get buy-in. You're gonna get members saying, hey, they're listening. They're asking me questions. They're on top of this. And that's the kind of trust you're going to need to do as a board and as leadership to get with your, your members and everyone. So um, I think it, it, these put new strains on leadership. There's no doubt about it. And as boards, we're going to have to step up and step in, and we're elected to do that. So, um, so I think that speaks to really the point number, number three here, that this, has, this is the human element of this, right? If anything, we need to be in much more communication with our stakeholders and members, because that's what we need when we're scared, when we're unsure, and that gives confidence and trust. So all of this means, I think as we look at our board agendas, um, we really need to be having much more, more often strategic dialogues, and it may mean more meetings to talk about some of these things that are impacting our members and stakeholders um, to get through this. And I think to your point, uh, Nikanor's idea of resilience, right? This idea of a, a, a sustaining strategy that may need, mean a whole lot of new things. You may be shifting resources dramatically um, and start realizing we've got, we don't have the talents we need to do what we need to get done in this time period. Where do we go to get them? Who do you partner with? Who do you collaborate with? Um, if you've got to do new, new things that you don't have that talent um, in-house for. So all of which is what has to, has to be part of this. Great points. And you know, that, Greg, that's a great point around, you know, you need to find that trusted support. It, uh, a lot of organizations, this was a question that came in about, can we do this ourselves? And I think that's a trap that a lot of associations fall in, that they can serve as the facilitator, uh, the convener, but also participate on that strategic planning. And that becomes difficult when you, when you start to mix that and try and be part of that strategic discussion. Um, when you need to be, you need to be engaged in that discussion. You don't need to be the one leading it. You need someone that can poke uh, through, in, and around the discussions that are happening there. Yeah, so I see a couple of questions. Um, Lowell has a question here about uh, the, the issue around organizations doing analysis in more nimble micro ways. And um, so I think there are a couple of great examples, right? These pulse surveys um, that I see a lot of groups shifting out to members now, which is really kind of tell us what your priorities are and we can now measure that change in priorities over two week segments. Um, so that you're getting real time data on what your members are dealing with, what's right in front of them and or what are they looking to you for as board leadership. So that's the one I've probably seen the most um, with groups really doing this pulse and literally every two weeks 
and the beauty of that is really you can track it over time, right? So one organization um, in our industry space that Lowell would be aware of is PCMA, Professional Convention Management Association, and they've been doing two-week surveys since this began. So it's fascinating to now see how that has changed over time. It's a great point, Greg. And, you know, just as much as we said that uh, there's a human element to this, that is where technology can help support that. You know, in, internally, we've used um, uh, employee performance management software that does take the pulse of our team, you know, every few weeks, and those provide data points. And there's no reason to think that you can't implement something similar for your membership, whether it's a new program or through existing programs and technology that you have in place where members are, are already uh, congregating online. So a question from Nolan about, you know, where are the opportunities, right? How do we find the opportunities in, in this? And, um, and I think it, it's on every level, right? In terms of how your members, are, their lives are shifting, their priorities are shifting. And in each industry, there are shifts happening that are going to uncover gaps, that are going to uncover opportunities based on what's happening in the space. So that's where this dialogue becomes ever more important with your members, with your sponsors, with your other stakeholders, because it's through that dialogue that we're gonna find out, oh, here's a new service or a new product that our members are saying they need because what this has done to their space, um, their profession, what's happening in their offices, their virtual offices now. So it's going to be able to uncover those opportunities. I think the other um, issue from a seven measures of success is those organizations that do better over the long term are those that collaborate and partner better. So I think in all of this, figure out who should we be talking to. If we're all challenged, there are probably three or four sister organizations in your space that you've had informal dialogue. Maybe you've actually done some work with over time. It's time to loop them back into a broader conversation. What could we be doing together under these circumstances that solve a concern or a need that both of us are hearing in the marketplace? And by coming together and doing it jointly, we can do it better, faster, cheaper, and provide a new benefit or a new service for our members and stakeholders. So it's in that dialogue that I think you're gonna find opportunity um, for associations to step into. Yeah, I mean, um, Greg, that, that's a great point in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, just the engagement. And I think the, the other opportunity I see is an opportunity for deeper engagement with our members, you know. Um, now you have an opportunity um, uh, with the presence, um, uh, virtual presence, to literally reach each and every of your stakeholders from wherever we are. You know, some of the experiences and the, the examples that I've, uh, we've gotten from here in Africa is uh, increased participation by um, association members that are actually out of the country, they, they, in what we call diaspora. So we are seeing increased participation uh, in, um, in association events by uh, members that uh, for many years have felt left out, you know, they couldn't participate in the physical um, events of the associations coming back. And uh, from this, then I see an opportunity into how do you tap into, into that particular class of membership that ordinarily felt left out. So here is an opportunity to be able to craft um, a new membership benefits and probably also an opportunity to be able to um, uh, create benefits that ultimately will, um, uh, will enable you to earn, earn new revenues you know, from these members that have always felt they are very far away and that, that, that they cannot be able to participate um, in your engagement. So that, that's some of the opportunities that actually um, I'm seeing emerging from this. Well, that brings up a really good point, Ikenor, about this whole issue of kind of taking the, the virtual space that we're all living in now and putting that overlay all of your products and services, right? So really stepping back and taking a look and saying, okay, if we're going to be in the virtual world forever, which we are going to be, whether we're talking live events or any sort of product and ser service delivery, our stakeholders are gonna want it when they want it, how they want it, and it's going to be on this much less than likely that I'm getting on a plane and traveling around the world. So what does that mean in terms of investment in virtual technologies and digital technologies to deliver not just around your annual meeting, but around all your other products and services or new products and services, right? So I listened to what you just said, right? The diaspora is in now a unique position to contribute their knowledge and experience from where they sit 
back into the association in Africa or, or Kenya in a way that, and can do it in a way that we didn't really have a way to provide before. And that presents new opportunities, right? To figure out how can that benefit, how can their knowledge and experience benefit the rest of the members? And can we create webinars and podcasts around that um, that, that deliver that value? So you're right. I think there's lots of this. And, and that's one of the things about virtual is that you can act, it makes, makes your information much more accessible. So then you start thinking, okay, what do we want to have open and as accessible as possible to everybody? And then what do we start gatekeeping um, and you pay for more access um, as you go. And that's how you start to build out revenue models for this. Great. So Greg, I have a, another question here around uh, how do we, we've created the plan, we're ready to go. How do we stay engaged? How do you keep the board accountable throughout the year? Yeah, that's results, right? Um, and as you said, the, uh, the ability to really track um, and that's one of the primary reasons the board exists, um, is to uh, set the strategy, um, set the, the mission and vision, and then be able to measure how well are we doing to achieving that. So that's the primary reason the board exists. So I think the board then creates and demands um, the information it needs to actually be able to judge how well are we doing? What are the metrics we want? What are the metrics we need? to determine how well we're actually delivering on what we say we do. And I think that's something that we're still, some organizations are better than others about really asking those hard questions. And, you know, because we're afraid of the response, well, if we don't take the response and build the response into what we do better, how does anything improve? So it really is all about this constant evaluation um, and judgment. And that's why I love needs assessments for organizations. Get out there and ask your members. What do they value about what you deliver and how well do they think you're doing it? Um, and by asking those two questions, you can really learn a whole heck of a lot. Okay. Any other questions out there, uh, either through the, the Q&A button there or chat? I'll give it a minute here. Um. Probably as, as, as they prepare a question, just one of the observations that um, um, I have experienced here is, I think in, in times like this, people fear uh, or are hesitant to reach out for help. You know, they, they are being nimble. They are being, they, they want to be very careful around the resources they have. Um, but this is the best time. And, and, and what we have seen is that those that, that have been bold enough to say, listen, uh, we are unable to do this on our own. We, we are looking for help to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to reorganize our, our strategy, to rethink. Um, the bold ones actually are going and seeking that help. So I think uh, one of the things that uh, um, I, I will encourage, you know, all of you is uh, don't fear, uh, don't hold back going to ask help if you can and you feel like um, uh, you don't have sort of like a clarity around how you want to, um, reorganize yourself how you want to reemerge out of this, um, feel free to, to, to reach out and, and, and seek for help. I think that that's important uh, so that you're not holding up at a time of need, whereas uh, just reaching out will have really helped you to um, unravel you know, some of those areas that you feel stuck, stuck in. I think that brings a really important point out, Nikanor, and that is that a lot of times boards want to have this conversation themselves. Um, but I think this is where a facilitator can actually help the process, right? Because a facilitator can kind of cut through some of the issues that might exist around the board table, ask some tough questions, go right at some of the sacred um, cows, as we call them um, here, the issues that are holding the association back and get that out on the table and really make sure um, it works. And uh, I think that's the value of an outside facilitator who can really come in um, and control the conversation differently, right? Drive it to a conclusion, but also make sure all the voices are heard because how many times have we been sitting around a board table and it's the same two people and they never stop talking and no one can control them, but a good facilitator can and make sure the voices are heard from everybody else around the table to get us the best result. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions here, so Thank you, Greg, Nikanor, and everyone that joined us. Uh, if you do have a question that comes up, please feel free to reach out. Uh, 
just scan your uh, the QR codes here. You can uh, connect with our leadership team. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have related to this or anything else uh, as you all navigate your own unique uh, situations with your organization. So uh, thank you again and uh, look forward to seeing you on one of our future webinars. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye, have a nice day.